This is God's day. It's a good day. So let us rejoice. My name is Kim Gilliland. I'd like to welcome you to our online worship at Cotton United Church. But before we begin, a couple of announcements. First of all, we do have in-person worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. You're welcome to join us for that. This week, however, we do have March break coming up. We won't have any child care or junior church this week. And also because of... Uh, because of March break, we also won't be having our Bible studies on Monday night. Both of our leaders will be on vacation, so uh, we'll continue with that the following week. <clears throat> also, I'd like to make you aware that, uh, as we're, we are aware of the situation in Ukraine with the war going on there, if you want to contribute to supporting the people of Ukraine, if you go to our church website, there is a secure link where you can donate and you can be assured that that money will get to where it needs to go where you want it to go so please go to that and contribute if you are if you are at all able to do that with that in mind um, let's worship God God is our light and our salvation we have no need to fear God hears us when we call in times of trial God comes to us in mercy let us worship God who blesses us with goodness. Would you pray with me, please? Let us pray. You, O oh God, are our protection and our shield. You stand before us to guide our feet along your path. You surround us with your angels to guard us from the forces of evil which threaten our lives. We gather in this time of worship in the inspiration of your spirit the work of your hands. Hear us as we pray to you. Listen to our songs and praise and adoration. Fill us anew with a full measure of your awesome spirit so we may have the gifts of this life, that we may have hope and renewal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is the second Sunday of Lent, a time for reflection and preparation as we approach the events of the crucifixion and resurrection. One of the things that we realize during Lent is that none of us is perfect. Each and every one of us falls short of God's glory. We need to think about that during Lent, yet we also need to realize that we're not called to beat ourselves up over that. God calls us to confess our sins, to repent. And once we've done that, not to dwell on things. Not to look at the past and, and wring our hands and say, woe is me, but rather to trust God to not just forgive us, but to forget our sins. I want to share with you a story that maybe you've heard before. It kind of goes like this. There was a minister who was uh, heard about a woman who claimed to hear the voice of God. And so he went to speak to her to see if this was indeed true. He found her sitting on a park bench. He approached her and asked if she indeed spoke with God, and she assured him that she did. And so he said to her, if you speak with God, then God should be able to tell you things that only God would know. That's correct, she assured him. So that means that God can reveal to you things that only God can know. <clears throat> That's what it means, she said, but only if God is willing to do that. Okay. So the minister thought back to a time when he was just a boy. And he'd been in a store where he saw a chocolate bar that looked very good and yummy. He wanted it, but he didn't have any money to pay for it. And so he looked around to see if anybody was watching, and no one was. So he took the chocolate bar, put it in his coat pocket, and walked out of the store. That was the first and only time he'd ever stolen anything in his life. And ever since then, he had felt very, very guilty about it. He deeply regretted it. Even though he had confessed his sin, years later, decades later, he still could not forget it. Remembering this event, the minister looked at the woman and said, If God can reveal things to you, then ask God what sin I committed when I was a child. The woman closed her eyes as if she was consulting with God. After a few moments, she opened her eyes, looked at the minister and said, you have asked God about a sin that you have already confessed. That's true, the minister replied. But I want you to tell me what the sin is. I can't, she said. I can't. Because you confessed your sins, it is gone. 
God has already forgotten it. The point of the story is that we're called not to dwell upon our sins. We're called to let those sins be in the past. Lent is not about beating ourselves up. Lent is, Lent is about understanding the past and moving on with the rest of our lives and knowing where we stand and by whose standards we live. The Apostle Paul wrote a lot about the standards that we should live by. I'm going to share with you some of those standards as we find them in Philippians chapter 3. I want to start by reading verses uh, 17 to 19 of chapter 3. Paul writes, Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live like us. For, as I've often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is their destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are on earthly things. Paul begins by talking to the people about who they're supposed to follow, what example they're supposed to follow. And Paul says, if you want to follow an example, follow me because I'm trying to get this right. And other people like me are trying to get this right too. So follow the people who live the way that I tell you to live. But then he goes on in verse 18 and 19 to talk about those who do the exact opposite, who live not by the way that Paul teaches, but rather they live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And it says that their destiny is their destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, their minds are on earthly things. That's not good news. It's not good news to know that your destiny is your destruction. It's not good news to know that you're an enemy of the cross of Christ. And yet, that is precisely what Paul says in the book of Philippians. That's precisely what we read in the Bible. Why are these people going to be destroyed? Because their minds are on earthly things, not on the things of God. They are seeking after the world. They are seeking after the things of the world. They are seeking after the ruler of the world, who is Satan or the devil, or whatever you want to call him. Many people are caught up in the ways of the world. You know, we, we think we live in a Christian country here in Canada, that we are based founded on Christian principles, and indeed we are founded, our nation is founded on Judeo-Christian principles and values. And yet, Christians are now a minority within our world, within our country. And uh, because we're a minority, our values, our ethics, our codes of conduct have been eroded. It used to be that you would might hear profanity, but people knew when and when not to say it, and and while uh, the, the men in the change room might uh, say a few things that would be a bit off color, they certainly would not say that, that around their wives and their families. And yet now, you hear the same language at the dinner table in some people's homes as you hear in the change room. Parents aren't raising their children the way they used to. Pa many kids are raising themselves as the parents are off seeking careers and and, and, and gratifications and, and making more money. Boys of the age of 12 are wanting to be sexually active and can be sometimes. And we've sexualized our daughters to the point where we sometimes don't recognize them as little girls anymore. The ways of the world are not pretty. They are alarming. Too many people don't know Jesus. They don't know that they need to know God. They don't know that they need to know Jesus, that they need to know Jesus Christ. Paul says that for those people, their destiny is a destruction because their minds are on earthly things. But here's the reality. We can't avoid the ways of the world. They are influential. Their influence is pervasive around us. Because here's, because here's the reality. As Christians, we watch the same TV shows as do our secular neighbors. We listen to the same music. We watch the same things on the internet. We're all in the same world. But how do we deal with that? 
How, how do we stand firm in the faith when, when the ways of the world are, are, so, are surrounding us? It's not easy. Now, the good news is, is, is this. In some senses, we're successful in doing that. For example, Christians are far more likely to give to charities than non-Christians. People of faith are more likely to be, uh, to be, to be generous with other people, to be other organizations. Christians, people of faith, are more likely to volunteer in community things, community organizations. Those are all really good things. And yet the not-so-good news is that in some ways we are not so dissimilar from our secular neighbors. We only have a slightly greater chance of a successful marriage. We have the same um, percentage of, of family and spousal abuse in the church. In fact, there are some studies that show that the more, Christ, the more conservative people are in their Christian values, in their Christian faith, in Christian churches, the more likely they are to abuse their spouse and families. That's disturbing. Our children are only slightly less likely to be sexually active before marriage. In many ways, we become just like the people who surround us. How do we change that? How do we turn the corner? How do we stand firm in the ways of Christ? Well, that's what Lent is all about. It's about changing the standards that we follow, changing from the standards of the world, which are changing all the time, rather following the timeless standards of God that are revealed to us through the truth of Scripture. That's what Lent is all about. How do we stand firm? How do we get back to the life that God wants us to live? How do we resist the temptation to fall? I want to look at three lies that we are told today. Three lies that Christians need to resist and avoid. We need to recognize them, though. And in recognizing them, then we can resist them. The first lie is this. That we have birth, and that we have death, and we have the things in between. But beyond that, there is nothing. There is no afterlife. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There is no kingdom. When we die... Everything ends, and that's it. If that was true, then you can do anything you want, because there are no eternal consequences. There is no God who is a judge. There is no God to look at your life and, and, and measure by a standard. There are no eternal consequences. And so you can experience anything you want to do. Go after your pleasures. There's no morality. There are, are no boundaries. You can do whatever you want to do. It just don't hurt anybody. So if you want to drink till you're sick, go ahead. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you're damaging your body and maybe damaging others as well. If you want to drive on the 401 at 180 or 200 kilometers an hour, go ahead, do that. If you want to walk naked down the street at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, go ahead, fill your boots. And if somebody doesn't want to see, well, don't look. That's all there is to it. But what does the Bible say? John 3, 36 says this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Jesus says that there are eternal consequences. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There is a judgment. The only question is, where do you spend eternity? In heaven or in hell? It's not, is there one? There is. Both of those exist. Where will you spend eternity? The first lie is that there is nothing else after this life. The second lie is this, that it's all about me. I'm the most important thing in the entire universe, and I should be able to get my needs met. My, self, my self gratification is paramount to everything. <clears throat> I have my needs, my possessions, my desires, my dreams, and as long as I go after them, I will live a full 
a, a, a full life. That's what I will do. <clears throat> it's a very selfish understanding of life, isn't it not? Do we just hoard things to ourselves? Yeah, what about <clears throat> helping the poor? <clears throat> what about volunteering in our world? What about doing things that are not necessarily about self-gratification, <clears throat> but actually maybe <clears throat> about self-sacrifice so that others can be better off? The world says, it's all about me. Go for it. Do it. Go ahead. Your life. You make choices. Go ahead. Have fun. But what does the church say? What does God say? What does the scripture say? I want to turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and then 44 to 45. <clears throat> Here, Luke is talking about a church and how they live. He says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of the breaking of bread and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to everyone as they had need. <clears throat> this is not about self-gratification. It's about using what we have to help others to live fully before God. It's not all about me. In fact, quite the opposite. It's about caring for others, reaching out, sometimes sacrificially. And so there's this contrast between the way of the world, which is self-gratification, and the way of Christ, which can often mean self-sacrifice. Which do you think God wants you to follow? I don't need to tell you. You already know. The way of the cross, the way of Christ, is to reach out to others and enable them to help them to be the people that God wants them to be, even if it means that we need to sacrifice something of what we do and what we want. The first lie is that this is all there is. The second lie is that it's all about me. And the third lie is this, that God accepts everyone. That comes as a bit of, what, bit of a surprise because, but some people think that God will, God is bound to accept everyone, regardless of what they do, the choices they make, or what they do. And maybe that's the biggest lie of all. According to that theory that uh, God accepts everyone, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian, do Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, Wiccan, whatever. God will accept you. There are many paths to God. It's just a case of choosing the right one. Or cho choosing anyone doesn't matter. They all, they all end up in the same place. So regardless of our choices or our actions or what we believe, God has to accept us because we say God has to accept us. And what does Jesus say? Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. Jesus says this, Go through the narrow gate. The gate that leads to destruction is wide. And the road that leads there is easy to follow. A lot of people go through that gate. But the gate that leads to life is very narrow. The road that leads to, to that gate is so hard to follow that only a few people find it. The world says that the gate is wide and the road is easy to follow to come to God. And yet, Jesus says the exact opposite. The road is hard to find. It is narrow. And so is the gate. And few will find it. It goes back to what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, their destiny is their destruction, and their minds are on earthly things. <laughs> narrow is a road that leads to Christ. And not every path leads to God. That is what the scripture says. There is one way for sure to be with God, and that is through Jesus Christ. So it leads me to a question. <clears throat> Who is in heaven because of you? Who will be in heaven because of you? Who have you shared your faith with? Who have you shown the narrow gate to? 
who have you shown the narrow path to the way of Jesus? We have those three lies. This is all there is. It's all about me. And God accepts everyone. We are called to stand firm against those lies. And Lent is a time to do that from the heart, to understand what those things mean and how we put them into practice in our lives today and how we improve who we are through coming to Christ daily with repentance and atonement and seeking him and his way of doing things in all that we do. Paul also writes this in Philippians 3. He talked about those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Then he says this in, chapter, in verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This affirms that we who are followers of Jesus Christ will be transformed by his love, that we are our true citizenship, we might live in Canada, but our eternal citizenship is in heaven with Jesus. And then we close off with chapter 4, verse 1, that says this, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord and in this way, dear friends. We're called to stand firm against the powers of the world and the place that they would take us. When we do that, when we stand firm in Christ, he welcomes us into his kingdom. And yes, we do fall short. And yes, we are not perfect. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will cleanse us of, of all iniquity and welcome us to our heavenly home. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Let us pray. O oh God of creation, we praise you for all your mercies and for your goodness. We thank you for sounds of laughter and the joy of song. We thank you for this Lenten season as we come together in your name. As your people, we pray for unity within your church. We are called to be one body in Christ. We ask you, God of love, to help us to break down denominational barriers that often cause divisions among us, your children. Bring us together as your hands, feet, and voices in a fallen world that needs so desperately to hear your good news of hope and salvation. We pray this day for those living through the unnecessary war in Ukraine. We would pray for increased security for all people. May your spirit inspire faithful people to find peaceful solutions and an end to aggression. And may your justice reign, O God. We would ask your blessing upon the world, O God of creation. In a world of strife, we pray for peace. In a world of darkness, we pray for light. In a world of fear, we pray for love. In a world of suffering, we pray for healing and fulfillment. Lift us up above the problems of our own making and set our feet upon the higher ground where your spirit will lead us. You, O oh God, are the great physician, and we pray for those who are sick at home or in hospital, remembering especially Carol and Mark and Ron and Pauline and Judith. Enable us, O oh God, to do your will. We need you to guide and teach us. Enable us to hear that small voice within that calls us to fulfill your purpose in our lives. Your ways are not our ways, O oh God of mercy. Help us to trust you in all things without fear, that we may walk down the path, the narrow path, to the narrow gate of your love. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, thank you once again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week in the third week of Lent. Until we see you again, go in peace. God bless. Amen.